Again, Emily, thanks so much for taking the time to chat. Do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Yeah, hey, uh, my name's Emily Dean and I'm a director. I just directed on Love, Death of Robots, an episode called The Very Pulse of the Machine, and I'm now directing a bunch of stuff that I can't talk about for a really long mm -hmm. time. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> That's always the case. Um, you know, you've got to go under the radar for a long time and bite your tongue from telling anyone the, the awesome stuff that you're doing. I was just curious, like for you growing up, like did you always imagine yourself in some kind of creative role or is it something you kind of fell into later in life? I'll say off the bat that uh, from being a little kid to where I am now, I didn't know what I was doing and I didn't know what I didn't know. And in a way that kind of helped because I didn't know that film was hard <laughs> and or being an artist was hard i just started drawing when i was three and coloring i won a coloring in competition when i was six and i was like yeah i want to be an artist for the rest of my life and uh something about me is that i'm like very headstrong so when i decide i'm gonna do something i guess that's what i'm gonna do <laughs> and uh yeah um I think when I was 12, my mom brought back a video camera from the airport or something. She went on a vacation and I just started playing with filming stuff and chopping stuff up and basic editing software and teaching myself um, and I'd make lots of videos and I started storyboarding when I was like 15, I think. So yeah, I was just very determined um, and because I grew up in a country town, um, I wasn't really around a lot of people, so there was no one to tell me no <laughs> yeah and it gave me a kind of i guess uh boldness to just go for it i love that um i can definitely relate it's one of those things because i do think there's a lot of people around you who at least people i know who are always being told like ah, oh, it's not a real career go get a you know go back to school or get a real job but um i think there's some real power in people not getting in your way and telling you no because it means that you're not going to have that limited thinking in the beginning. Instead, you can think, well, what if, you know, if it is easy, what would it look like rather than thinking it's got to be difficult? Mm, yeah, absolutely. I'm curious too, especially coming from a small town in Australia, um, what was it like for you to kind of transition, knowing like you wanted to get into, uh, let's say storyboarding specifically, what was that like trying to find your first job and kind of break into the industry. Uh, I'd imagine it's, you can't really do that in a small town, so. My high school had like an internship two week program where they were like, you know, in the 10th grade, they could say, go get an internship. And through a family friend, I managed to get like in an ad agency, just kind of getting coffees for people. And um, from there, as soon as they found out I could draw, they needed somebody real quick. And so I just offered to do it and they paid me like 50 bucks, uh, you know, cash in hand to just draw storyboards. And I ended up storyboarding for like Kellogg's and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So a um, little bit of like, oh, someone knew someone and then I showed up and I had a skill and it they worked. needed someone to, <laughs> to do it. So that was my kind of first taste of it. Yeah. Cool. I love that. And I was curious too, like you studied at Afters back in Australia and Cal Arts. Like how important do you think it is for people to find academic training to get into, let's say, storyboarding or other creative roles? I think back then it was more important than it is now. But the big thing that academic training got me was an excuse to like get out of the small town and go to the bigger city. Um, so, you know, because you don't know anyone in a city. So when you're going from, say, Bungendore, Canberra to Sydney, you know, making that leap, it helps to have a community. Um, and like be doing classes or whatever. And the same with um, making the jump to LA for CalArts. I don't know, it's it's all comes down to skill and like how hard you're willing to work and how many hours you're willing to put in and just like all these other like soft skills, you know? I don't think the academic training is necessarily that important. Um, I think if you can find it online, then yeah, you can do it yourself. Yeah, no, it's, it's always interesting because, yeah, I think a lot of time it is also like you get to build a network, as you mentioned, you know, going to a big city, you don't really know people, but when you're huddled in with other people, like-minded people who are interested in the same things you are, then you kind of, it's a chance to build that bond with some strangers that you otherwise might meet, so. Yeah, I will say something, like when I first got to CalArts, um, there were teachers there who kind of had a big talk with everyone and they said, 
look, there are some kids who are going to be coming in in their first year and they're going to be amazing and they're going to sit on their laurels and they won't grow. And then there are other kids who'll come in bottom of the class and then by end of year one, two, three, you can see the growth and they end up going off and doing great things. So it really comes down to how hard you're going to work. I love that. Um, I like that a lot, actually. I'd love to talk a little bit about your early career. And one thing I noticed, like you worked in uh, uh, or doing, did some training, I should say, in Pixar's story department. Like, how did you find that opportunity and what was that experience like? Pixar used to do these portfolio days with all the schools. So um, you would have like you submit your portfolio and they review it and they would pick, I guess, five kids at, in my year from around the schools to like come in and do the summer training. Um, I think they still do it, but it's not open to just anyone in school. It's open to anybody, uh, I think, anyway. And I think it's a lot more kind of like open and, you know, bigger classes and stuff. But um, yeah, it was a really intense experience. <laughs> um, because, you know, you're in a training environment in a major studio, they're working on like big films. It was the summer of The Good Dinosaur, um, oh. Story Crunch. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I had lunch at Can't Fail Cafe with a few of my friends where they'd be pouring their heart and soul out about how four years of work had gone down originally when they uh, rebooted it. Yeah. Yeah. So the whole story department was a complete upheaval at the time. And in a way, one of the mentors actually said, you're getting to see what it's really like, like not without all the gloss and sheen, but what it's really like when it's down to the wire, like crunch. And so that was very eye opening for me. But yeah, they weren't hiring, unfortunately, at the end of that. So we were training for a job that didn't exist. <laughs> Still, I think it'd be a pretty amazing experience. Totally. Uh, yeah, because at least Good Dinosaur originally, like they spent four years on it and then threw the entire thing out. And so then they went back to the drawing board, which yeah, I can't imagine for anyone like putting that much work into something and not seeing the light of day. Um, it's definitely got to be a bit heartbreaking. Can you talk a little bit about your work on the Lego Batman movie and the Lego uh, movie too as well? I'm just kind of curious like what your work on that was. Oh yeah, so I was a story artist on those movies and they were a lot of fun. They were really my first movies like where I was storyboarding and cutting my teeth. Um, I applied actually to Animal Logic for what was the Lego 2 movie, but then it became Lego Batman because Warner Brothers kind of switched the release dates. And I managed to kind of eke my way in to Animal Logic. They had one story position and I wanted to work back in Australia to be closer to family. Mm -hmm. And I, um, they had storyboard artists already, but they had one junior position and I managed to kind of elbow my way in mm -hmm. um, just by like, literally emailing every week saying, hey, how's it going? Uh, <laughs> just checking in on, on that storyboarding position. And honestly, it was really great because um, I got given a lot of responsibility really early. And whether I was given it or I was just like kind of persistent and kept like talking up in story meetings and be like, oh, this should happen and that should happen. And, you know, what if that happened? Yeah, I think they just saw that I was really eager and just threw a lot of work my way. And um, I, I drew a lot of boards on that movie. But what ended up being great about it was um, originally they were kind of thinking about it as a little bit of a Batgirl Begins storyline. And they were like, we need someone to figure out Batgirl's whole thing, what her story is, what her issues are as a character and stuff. So I got to do development on Batgirl and how she goes from being kind of timid Barbara Gordon to Batgirl and all the kind of conversations that were happening around gender and race and stuff in the studio at that time. Yeah, uh, even though they didn't kind of go with the whole <laughs> amount of work that I did because it's just too much, <laughs> uh, you know, a lot of it made it into the movie and it was really cool to see that and just to feel like I contributed to a main character um, and then from there, I rolled on to uh, the Lego Movie 2, which was Barrels of Fun. I was asked to help figure out the sister world. Um, so spoiler for those who haven't seen the movie, but um, everyone goes to the sister world and uh, it's all in the mind of the, the little sister. So they were like, we need a feminine voice to like 
tackle this sister world stuff and I was like you want me drawing stuff inspired by the never ending story and Princess Bride and every fantasy sci-fi strange world female twist I'm in yeah <laughs> so I was just yeah I was just doodling and drawing and coming up with creatures and stories and characters and ideas and stuff I was kind of known in the building of Bricksburg which was Dan Lin's office for the Lego movies at the time during Lego Batman I transitioned back to LA and kept working for Warner Brothers so I got to know the team over at Warner Brothers pretty well, as well as Dan Lin, who's an independent producer. And he had a lot of like movies that were coming through Bricksburg that he was, um, you know, attached to or reading and stuff. And so he did what's called a live action think tank, um, which was just sort of a lunch where we all sit around. And if you're invited, you can come and have lunch and just read scripts and like say, is this a good thing to turn into a movie? And so. I got involved in that and I started pitching my own ideas and storyboarding and so from there I kind of branched out just from the Lego movies to other projects. It's really cool. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious too, like knowing that that was like a, you know, a, a big unique experience and I'm curious like were there any big lessons or even just takeaways you had from that time that kind of carried over to later in your career, whether it's advice or, or even just mindsets around doing work and character development yeah i think i was just like trying to be a helpful person um i think people underestimate how much that is a good value to have in the office because so many people you know executives or producers or whatever they have so much on their plate and they're just looking for someone to help them out and i was in my 20s and i was eager and i love movies and i wanted to learn so i would just offer up my time um and just say, oh, you need someone to storyboard that, you know, work out a fee and, you know, do it on the side. So I was actually doing a lot of extra work on top of my work. I don't know <laughs> if uh, if that's good or not, but um, in terms of <laughs> like work-life balance or I had the energy and I just sort of did it. And I think I developed a reputation as being just a helpful person. Um, and so that got me more work and then, yeah, it just kind of passed it down the chain a bit. Cool. And yeah, I could, it's one of those mindsets that um, is pretty rare. Usually everyone's kind of fending for their, themselves, but I think um, it's the same way that when you work with great people, you continue to work with those great people because it, it works. Everyone's got each other's back and because it is so rare, it's, it's something you cling on to. But um, no, that's great. Like, and it's a good reputation to have as well. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I was curious, like, uh, just to jump ahead a little bit, like, I'd love to talk about LDR season three. Congratulations, by the way, uh, the short, uh, I Thanks, should say yeah. the episode is amazing, but I was curious, like, what was that experience like? Like, how did that come about? Again, I guess my uh, reputation preceded me a little bit in that I found this email in my inbox um, from Blur. It was actually from Victoria Howard, who's the um, producer uh, mm -hmm. of LDR. And she reached out and said, would I come in for a meeting? And this was back in summer of 2019. And I didn't really know what it was about, um, but I did love LDR volume one. And I was like, I really hope this is LDR. <laughs> <laughs> so I went in for a meeting and I met um, Jennifer U. Nelson. And I guess they'd heard about me from other people in the industry. And they said, we're looking for directors for volume two at the time. And um, would I be down to read some scripts that they were working on for um, volume two and what kind of stories would I be interested in telling and that kind of thing and what I want to do and I said yeah I'd be I'd love to um, so I went away with a bunch of scripts and then I zeroed in on the very pulse of the machine short story by Michael Swanwick um, I read the short story first and then I read the script and I just fell in love with the story um, and I went back to Jennifer and Victoria and said, look, I've always wanted to do something that's inspired by Mobius and a tribute to Mobius. And I feel like the abstract nature of this story would work really well. Um, and so I, they said, OK, great. I put together a pitch deck and um, pitched it to Tim and um, Tim loved it and so I got the job in the room and then they said at the end 
of my pitch. Um, we don't know how the fuck we're going to make this, but that's what the just, show is all about. <laughs> sorry to interrupt, but when you said Tim, yeah. liked it, I was going to say, I'm, I'm sure there's a few more F bombs in there. Like, that was fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, literally. And also, he wasn't wearing shoes, which is classic Tim. Uh, <laughs> yeah, flip flops is the best you'll you'll get from him or sandals. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it was, it was awesome. So once that ball started rolling, um, I started working on it in uh, late 2019. And then um, it was originally meant to be for volume two, but then pandemic and mm -hmm. um, other complications just meant that it got pushed to volume three because we needed extra time. So, yeah. I was talking with Orion Tate. Uh, I've known him for decades, and he mentioned the same thing. I think that they originally were looking to do something for season two and then ended up getting pushed into season three as well. So you're not alone. I'm curious too, like, what was it like working under Tim and Jennifer and um, Fincher as well, um, just in general, like the whole creative leadership there? Well, first I should say, I was like obviously working closer with Tim and Jennifer because Fincher, um, you know, he's doing live action and he's off um, running around the world. But <laughs> I worked really closely with Tim and Jennifer and it was really great. Um, Jennifer really mentored me through the process, which was awesome. We, Me, Tim and Jennifer are all very different personalities and you get us in a room. There's like this like creative like friction because this story was, it's so abstract. It could go any which direction you wanted. And so we really had to like hone in on what it was about and exactly where sort of emotional arcs and peaks would happen and climaxes and then move on and so on. Um, and Tim actually described the film at, when we were kind of working in the early days on it. He's like, it's like uh, an art film posing as a survivalist thriller. And I was like, 100%. Yeah. Love that. <laughs> yeah. So um, I think Tim is like, <laughs> he's such a big personality and he's just like, ah, you know, <laughs> just mm -hmm. go for it. And Jennifer is very quiet and kind of, but very, you know, cutting into the point and then i'm very sort of oh you know nature in the world and like mm -hmm. you know like oh big dreams hopes fantasies you know so you get the three of us in a room and it's just it's chaos special. it's chaos <laughs> that's cool i'm curious too like what attracted you to the story um more more specifically even the female protagonist um i'm just kind of curious like you mentioned before being inspired by morbius for the art which Again, uh, I love that because not as many people give them props as, um, <laughs> as as needed. But yeah, I was curious, like, yeah, what inspired you to really kind of take it on in terms of the, the character and, and the whole backstory as well? So I was actually drawn to the, uh, the story, the kind of hook of this astronaut being on stranded on the moon of Io and what seems like she's talking to herself, you know, talking to a voice. And as you read the short story, I was like, is Martha Kevilson, is she mad? Is she insane? What's going, is she on drugs? Like what's going on here? And then as the story unfolds, you realize she's speaking to an alien consciousness of the moon of Io. And so I just loved that idea that at the end of the story, you realize that you've been reading this relationship the whole time and that this relationship really is a kind of a celestial love story. And that's what I was really drawn to first. And the fact that it's a female astronaut is just a bonus because I was like, yeah, we want to see more cool kick-ass female characters. So here's a chance to do it. And some of my movie favorite movies are like Contact and Alien and yeah, stuff with just like really badass women. So I wanted to do my own version of that. I was giving Tim shit about that recently because um, that's going to with Terminator and everything else, it's always kind of been his thing is tough women um, going back decades. So, uh, yeah, I mean, again, I, I'm sure he would have been all for it, but I thought the character development was great. Like the the whole story in general um, is just, yeah, spot on. And I, I'm guessing uh, heavy metal kind of played a role in, in terms of the influence a little bit. Absolutely. Yeah, I should mention in my initial pitch to Tim that I was like, Mobius is like, you know, such a huge influence on science fiction across genres, across film and like heavy metal, you know, he was one of the founding artists of it. And I feel like because this show is about, you know, based on stories from heavy metal, it makes sense to do a tribute to him. And they were like, 
Yeah, hundred percent. Curious too, like what research did you have to do for the story kind of taking place in outer space? So we looked into a lot of different things, everything from like the gravity on Io compared to Earth to light, you know, how much light they get from the sun and, um, you know, the speed of the rotation because Io is spinning very fast around Jupiter and then on its own axis, it's spinning quite quickly. And, you know, we really went down a bit of a wormhole of research, which was great. But at the end of the day, I kind of made the call that, look, it's got to be believable within the world of the film itself. And if she doesn't have enough gravity to make dragging this sled of a, with a dead body on it look arduous, difficult, and emotionally draining, then it's not going to land emotionally with the audience. So. We chose to dial up the gravity a little bit to make it a little bit closer to Earth. I mean, it's still dragging a dead body across the plane for 40 kilometers or so is pretty difficult. So, <laughs> um, but it speaks to how strong she is as a character. And then other things like, yes, you know, if we were doing it realistic, um, there would only be a fraction of the light that you'd see from the sun. So the whole vista wouldn't be lit up the way we have it. but. You know, this is science fiction, lean into the fiction a little bit and make it all yellow and bright and then you can really play with it. Yeah, I mean, you always got to mix between reality is boring and um, hyper reality of, of what yeah. the story. Not to mention when it comes to gravity, I don't even know what, uh, you know, a human body would be like under those conditions being that close to the mass of Jupiter. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, whether your blood could even be pumping around your body. I don't know. <laughs> so you mentioned, too, about COVID and that kind of setting things back a bit. I was curious about your experience, like how did that affect things? And also, how did you overcome those kind of creative challenges? COVID hit just as we finished the story reel. I was actually supposed to fly across to Japan to direct the team out at Polygon Pictures. Mm -hmm. um, and that all got locked down. And so, and, and Japan itself got locked down. So everyone at the studio obviously started working from home. So they had to do a big recalibration of, you know, just machinery and everything. And then on my end as a director, it's like, okay, so I was going to be directing these folks from at the studio. You know, I like to not exactly sit over the shoulder, but like be able to communicate with people in person. How can I give that same communication? <laughs> Yeah. Even more, you know, I don't speak Japanese. <laughs> we had translators and long Zoom calls. Um, and I would sort of set like, I guess it was sort of like teaching a class in that I would like shoot video of myself um, performing Martha's actions. Like I went to Santa Monica Beach and I dragged a weight around and said, look how my hips are moving, you know, as my feet are sliding in the sand and, you know, the posture of that. And when I'm falling, you know, I fall on this. <laughs> I did a lot of my own stunts, basically. I fall on this hip and this is the tilt of the body and so on. And so we'd go through and like analyze my videos and I'd perform all the uh, lip sync, um, everything. So paint overs so it was just like it was very much like a, a master class with myself jennifer u nelson jed i don't know you know jerome nope. dinshan yeah who's the vfx supervisor who is. you can give him the smile That's oh funny. yeah uh one a great chef he he makes amazing pastries and two a wizard at photoshop um just in the middle of zoom calls i'd be describing okay we need it to look a little bit more like this and what do you know jed's like pulling it up <laughs> as we speak. So me total all. rock star. And then Victoria Howard. I mean, everyone who worked on this show, I'm just like total top of their game. Awesome. So lots of Zoom calls is the answer and lots of very long Zoom calls because we had to translate everything. So if you imagine mm -hmm. me saying one thing and then a translator translating to Japanese folks and then them speaking back. <laughs> so mm -hmm. very long. <laughs> Yeah, I can imagine that's going to be a bit problematic at, at times for sure. I was also just wondering, uh, back in 2018, right? Like you produced and directed your first ever live action sci-fi short film, which was Andromedia. 
Andromeda, yeah. I should say. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, what was that like? Like, what inspired you to create your own work? Actually, I should say before that, I my first animated short was done in 2012, and I taught myself Flash. So wow. I'd kind right. of been making. <laughs> no, 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 it's all good. Like I, I've just kind of always been making stuff for myself and trying to figure out a way to work that in with my industry jobs basically <laughs> um but uh yes to 100 i i kind of made andromeda in 2018 and that was my first real step into live action and that was actually after i worked on a film called hotel artemis and um i had been on a live action set and worked with drew pierce and the cinematographer chung hun chung and i kind of like was like okay i think I think I can give this a crack. I'm not sure. But honestly, I think I was getting a little bit burnt out after doing years and years of Legos. Um, there's only so many years you can draw boxy Lego figures. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I was like, if, if it was up to me, what would I really want to make? I wrote this short story or this short film really quickly. I wish I'd actually spent more time on the script. And I just kind of reached out to friends and was, um, you know, is there anyone who's happy to produce, you know, and um, an actor I met when I was dog walking, uh, his name's Aaron Glenane. He's a great Aussie friend of mine. And um, he's since gone on to do like Snowpiercer, the TV show and um, Interceptor on Netflix. But I was just walking my dog and he was walking his friend's dog and we ran into each other and I was like, I want to make a film. Do you want to be in it? <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, yeah, why not? <laughs> yeah. And then just like friends of friends got together and just after helping out at Warner Brothers, I kind of made friends and with a few of the execs and they hooked me up with um, a great cinematographer, Logan Triplett and just other great folks. And we shot this thing in three days in LA and down at Point Doom in Malibu. And I mm -hmm. very slowly went into the post-production process because it ended up taking a lot longer than I thought it would and came out the other side um, and submitted it to festivals and stuff. But it was a really good experience. And I think that might have been maybe the reason why I got called in for LDR because they said, they were interested in people who had done animation and live action and could do both. Cool. And I'm curious too, like, um, again, like what was that experience like? Did you learn a lot from making a live action short film in this case? Um, yeah, again, just the kind of experiences you get such as post-production being a nightmare. Um, is there any big key takeaways that you have from doing that? that have carried over to other projects? I wore a lot of hats on that production just because, you know, it's an indie and you're wanting to save money. At a certain point, I realized, oh, you really have to have people doing this job. It's a, it's a professional job. I think I was like semi-producing. I was writing, directing, acting, production design, you know, helping with set dressing and every, you're just trying to, you're just pulled in too many directions and it actually made me appreciate um, the industry again because like oh it's just so nice when some one person can do that one thing really well and this other person can do this other thing really well um, so I learned that I'm not good at wearing too many hats like that also I had to step in as an actor which I'm not <laughs> really an actor so because uh, yeah the, we couldn't land an actor for this little bit part so you just learn a lot just going through the pipeline from the start to finish to be honest because when you're in the industry and you're kind of doing your own little piece of the puzzle you're only seeing things in this kind of very narrow view but when you zoom out and you're directing something or involved in something from a to z then you really go, oh, okay, I see how it all fits together and why things happen the way they do and how much things cost, which is a really important thing to mm -hmm. know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, it, it was really just a way for me to learn, which was great. Hopefully other people got something out of it too. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they did. 
I, I guess like I'm gonna leave this as a pretty open-ended question, but do you have any advice for people who are thinking about creating a short film, or, um, just in terms of either getting started or, like I said, keeping this completely open-ended? Like, what advice would you give to them? Yeah. Um, well, one, you just gotta do it. There's always plenty of reasons not to do something, and you're never gonna be ready. Um, there's never gonna be a perfect time. You just have to do it now, no matter how inconvenient it is. Um, so you've got to get yourself in that mindset. I'll tell you a mistake that I made, which was I rushed the pre-production and then ate, had to kind of eat the cost of that in the post-production. So I rushed the pre-production in that I thought I was just going to make, you know, just kind of like a, a scene. I wasn't even thinking of like a short. I was just like, I just want to film a scene. You know, I, there's this thing that I'm imagining about an android and a little girl. And then it started ballooning and ballooning and ballooning and became a full on short. I advise people to have your idea on paper figured out in the script stage. So that way you don't have to eat the cost of it down the pipeline. And that's just a golden rule for any production, I'd say. The more that you can figure out in the pre-production, the better. I think it's great advice. I'm curious too, just in terms of your production banner, Grade 8 Productions, you're working on a graphic novel right now. Is that right? Can you talk yeah. a little bit about that IP? So it's an idea I came up with, I guess in 2015, but I've sort of just been working on it. The graphic novel is called Iora, and it's a sci-fi world called Iora set in a distant galaxy somewhere, you know, not related to Earth. And the story is about two sisters. Kira Khan is a 17 year old girl who is, she's a teenager. Uh, she's a crabfish farmer and she is raising her little sister, May, who's about six or seven years old. And she's, the, May is like kind of tempestuous. She's a stubborn little kid. But more importantly, she has uh, supernatural psychic powers. And I kind of describe it like this 17 year old girl is trying to raise the atom bomb, basically. <laughs> it's set on this distant planet, um, on a desert planet inspired by Australia, actually, a post climate apocalyptic um, That'll never planet. Happen. <laughs> <laughs> May and her powers get discovered by this um, kind of evil kind of imperial force. I'm not calling it the Empire because I don't want any comparisons to Star Wars. But uh, Kira and May are forced to go on the run and become refugees across the desert to find a safe place to um, save May from being captured and turned into a weapon for the enemy. Yeah, and it's based on my grandparents a little bit uh, being refugees um, from China during World War II. And um, yeah, it's uh, it's sci-fi YA epic fantasy series. Yeah. That's cool. Um, Thanks. Do you have any release date of like when you think it will be coming out? I'm actually taking it to publishers this fall because I tried to pitch it as an animated series a few years ago, like a year or two ago. And the response I got from everyone I pitched to was like, oh man, this is so cool. Uh, we love the idea. You seem really cool, but we're never going to make this. Never in a hundred years. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. Yeah. Open Netflix door now and say, hey, remember yeah. me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that's awesome. I'll definitely keep an eye out for it. And I guess like one or two more questions. On your website, you've got a whole page dedicated to resources helping uh, up and coming film students, as well as uh, filmmakers, things like that. How important is it for you to give back and give resources and help other people grow themselves with their passion? Yeah, it's pretty important to me, actually, because I just remember being in Australia and being really frustrated that I was trying to learn and figure out where to go, who to talk to, what to do to get my foot in the door in the industry, and then also just like how to work your way up in the industry, how to survive in the industry even. And so I wanted to just make a page on my website that told me thing, told the world things that I wish I knew when I was coming up. And yeah, I'm also in, also in addition to that, I'm on the Australian Film TV Radio School Alumni Committee. Um, and so we're talking about like scholarships and 
other stuff like that. So just trying to give back because yeah, it sucks when <laughs> <laughs> when you don't know anything and you're just trying to figure it out. No, I think it's great. And um, again, like I think a lot of people can relate to that story of growing up, you know, in, in a smaller town or things like that, where it's like you don't know people. It's not like your uncle or auntie did this and that. It's it's where you really need to kind of create your own future. And um, again, like congratulations on all of your success with accomplishing everything you've done so far. And I can't wait to see what comes next. Oh, thanks, man. That's, that's really nice of you. <laughs> where can people go to find out more about you? And, you know, obviously I'll link to your website and everything else as well, but is there any resources or go-to places you'd recommend? emilydean.net is my website. Um, I'm occasionally on Instagram under Emily Limyon Dean. Um, and I'm posting some behind the scenes stuff from Very Pulse the Machine there. So if you're curious on that, those are the two big ones. And grade8productions.com um, is a little landing page for my own little production company of two people. Uh, so you can see what I'm up to there. Um, cool. But yeah. I love it. Again, Emily, thank you so much for taking the time. It's been really awesome. Thanks so much, Alan. <laughs>